it puts Americans out of work because they're forced to sell stuff at a loss. Who would have an incentive to make fuel economy go up? And if you can't do it, you're going to get fined or you have to sell more stuff with smaller engines. What's that? Uh, wouldn't they want lower fuel economy? I thought it was the tree huggers. But the tree huggers in the 70s, if you saw video clips, they had hair down to their asses and were barefoot and doing all sorts of drugs and having all sorts of fun. They're now the baby boomers that are running the world. Back then, they didn't have the resources or the political clout to go to Washington and say, make this happen. Now they do. So if they're still tree huggers, now they got the political and financial clout. It was the Japanese Automotive Manufacturers Association that convinced our government to pass a law that hurts the big three. And if you remember the Japanese in the 1970s, they didn't know how to make a truck or a vehicle with a big ass engine. They're pretty good at it right now, but back then, they actually helped pass a law that helped them sell the stuff that they were good at and forced their competition to sell stuff at a loss. My point there is when you widen margins, cutting costs seems to be the most effective way for doing so. You could increase sales on stuff that has really good margins, but I think in saturated competitive industries that are a global bloodbath, it's just not an option, okay? All right, if you look at the bottom part there, you can widen margins or increase asset turnover rate. So what's asset turnover rate? Well, you take your sales revenue for a year, divide it by your total assets. What are your total assets? It's your current assets plus your fixed assets. What are your fixed assets? Stuff that I bought that's worth something, like a factory, land. And what are my current assets? How much inventory do you have on hand? What's it worth? Because you paid for it. Accounts receivable, help me here. This means uh, the customer wrote the check and it's in the mail, but legally you can say it's cash in hand from your accounting class, does that sound about right? And then also you have cash on hand. So my question is, this is all about how do we make ROI go up? We widen margins by cutting costs. Based on that calculation, what are some of the things that you could do to increase a company's asset turnover rate? Backtrack a little bit. What's that? You could, but we're going to pretend that increasing sales, and if you can increase sales and not require more resources to do it, like if you increase sales times two, but then you have to consume twice as many resources to do it, it's probably a wash. But if you can increase sales by 50% with no extra consumption and resources, or at least not 50% more, yeah, you're going to make your asset turnover rate go up. Absolutely. I'm assuming that in manufacturing and saturated competitive industries, they're not sitting around saying, let's increase sales. So they have to come up with other ways to make ROI go up because increasing sales just isn't an option for them. Yeah? Uh, your assets. Yep. Uh, do, so decreasing with that, that means do more with less. I'll, I'll give you an example. 40 years ago, if you built a car factory, it would cost you a billion dollars. It would employ like 3,000 people. Today, if you build a car factory, you can do it for $300 million, and it won't employ more than 1,000 people. And that new factory today will crank out six times the volume that a factory did 40, 50 years ago. That's doing more with less. There was a time when GM employed a million people and did $100 billion a year in annual sales revenue. Toyota did it with 70,000 people. Who's doing more with less? Who has higher asset turnover rate? Who has wider margins? Who can more competitively price their products so their ROI goes up, their stock goes up, their sales and revenue goes up? Toyota was able to at that point. Through the reemergence from that bankruptcy though, if you look at who's leaner and meaner, General Motors is actually doing more with less than Toyota right now. Toyota is actually stuck with some legacy costs and workers and contracts that GM doesn't have to deal with because they started over. I will admit it was really convenient for us in Michigan that the government gave GM $40 billion. And thank goodness, because our economy is at 5% unemployment in the state of Michigan. Nationally, we're at 5.1. They actually think, had the government not saved General Motors, so many suppliers would have gone out of business that also supplied to everyone else that the entire auto industry globally could have collapsed if just General Motors went bankrupt and wasn't able to reemerge. So you could say the 40 billion saved a global industry that employs a lot of people with great paying jobs. I make the argument that how did we ever let that happen when one company, if it went out of business, could destroy an entire industry globally costing millions and millions and millions, and millions of people directly and indirectly their jobs. So back to your point, outsourcing. You could do more with less. Uh, how about inventory? If you don't have any inventory, 
your asset turnover rate goes up. A huge push in supply chain management is no inventory. If we need stuff to build stuff, you get it to our factories just as we need it. We don't want it sitting around. And sometimes they'll do stuff like, uh, I'm not going to pay you for that part until they actually buy my car. And the supplier's like, uh, that doesn't sound cool. It's like, I made it and I gave it to you. You're using it. Why can't you pay me? If you have enough leverage, and that's what we teach our students, we teach them, Negotiate the terms and conditions of a contract, and if you have leverage, don't necessarily abuse your suppliers, but do whatever it takes to pump up these numbers in a way that's legal and ethical. Okay? Uh, you guys have heard of Apple. When they sell something for a dollar, they probably have 80, 90 cents left over. They're obsessed with supply chain management because they're one of the greediest companies on the planet. Good for them. They're prospering and flourishing because of that. You guys love Apple. I read that Apple has $200 billion in cash. Not, not, not 2 billion, not 20, not 200 million. They have 200 billion dollars in cash. And I thought to myself, okay, no one's ever seen this before. When you have 200 billion in cash, you could actually say, I'm going to buy an industry in America. They could buy an entire industry. They have 200 billion in cash. Cash is an asset. If you look at this calculation, their asset turnover rate goes down because they have so much cash. Our accounting standards are so greedy. They basically penalize companies for having cash sitting around, okay? Our, our accounting system basically says, make stuff, sell stuff, make lots of money. When you make lots of money, reinvest it so you make even more money. Apple right now is sitting on 200 billion. That lowers their asset turnover rate. That lowers their ROI. So investors are like, wait a second, your ROI isn't as good as we want it to be. Apple tells them, don't worry. We're figuring out what to do with that money so that long term you're going to love our ROI. Also, Apple's margins are very, very good, so that's what they're communicating to investors. You could argue that our accounting system is a little antiquated, but it revolves around greed. Uh, I used to think if I had $200 billion, what industry would I get into? And one, I would never, ever get into the auto industry. Why? In the auto industry, if you sell something for a dollar, after you pay for all of your bills, you got one, two, three, four cents left over. You give me an industry, when I sell something for a dollar, there's 50, 60, 70, 80 cents left over, I'll invest in that industry. So initially, here was my prediction. This is a few years ago. Apple's building its way up to 200 billion in cash. Okay? At that point, you can actually buy an industry. A lot of people think Apple's sitting on the money, trying to figure out what the next $1 trillion industry is. And when they figure it out, they're going to have the money to be the major player in that industry. So I thought, for sure, uh, what's Apple talking about doing? Has anyone heard? Designing and building what? Cars. Cars. Yeah. So, so uh, the educated idiot who thinks he knows everything predicted that if you had $200 billion, you do not get into the auto industry. The, the margins are so freaking thin. Apple right now is hiring tons of people from Metro Detroit with auto industry backgrounds. A lot of those baby boomers that don't necessarily want to retire charge a premium for their experience. Uh, rumor has it they're trying to figure out how to design and build electric vehicles. And now they're trying to decide, do we actually design and build them, or do we build and design the technology associated with the electric vehicles? Uh, with 200 billion, they can do whatever they want. Uh, maybe they decide that 3D printing will transform American manufacturing. So you don't need factories anymore. You don't need tools and equipment. $200 billion kind of starts to get you there. So I, I think they're sitting on it, but they're getting penalized when it comes to this calculation. But in general, if I could leave you with an impression is you're all going to work for probably a company that's obsessed with this calculation, and you have to decide what contribution do I make to that calculation. And if you make a significant one, you've got nothing to worry about. My students in the supply chain program, uh, most of them start off between 50 and 65K a year. By the time they're 30 or 35, they're usually responsible for between 100 and 200 million in spend. When you spend that much money on behalf of your employer, if you're really good at your job, you can generate huge cost savings, which means, okay, they're not going to pay you millions, but if you can save them millions, don't, shouldn't they be paying you like six digits? So a lot of my students, they're called commodity managers, and they basically manage lots of different parts with lots of different suppliers, and most of them in, are in their 30s. I've been at Western 17 years, and most of them base pay are between 100 and 150K a year, and they make anywhere from 20 to 50K a year in bonuses. It's easy when someone gives you 200 million in spend and you save them millions annually to walk into your boss's office and say, I'm worth 135K a year. And that's not a bad thing if you're 32, 33 years old. 
do you feel like in general you got a feel for what the supply chain management stuff is? It's basically figuring out how to do things better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, companies are telling us, make them take a law class where they are pseudo lawyers. Make them take engineering classes where they can talk to engineers at work. One of the biggest skill sets that I'm hearing from employers, and this applies to all of you, is data analytics. So we keep adding classes to this major. The supply chain program in the business college requires over 13 classes, that's over 40 hours. So if you wait until your junior and senior year, what's implied by that is you're gonna delay graduation. But if you don't go this route, if I can make a recommendation, data analytics, for example, can you take Microsoft Office Excel and turn it into an artificial intelligence system that helps you make better decisions? An example would be you go to work and your boss gives you 900,000 lines worth of data that says this is what we bought and where we bought it. Companies for a long time have been buying parts from China. We have data now that proves that it's actually cheaper to source in the United States because what about the lead times, the inventory, the quality, the insurance, the freight, you add all that stuff over a period of time, China's actually turning out to be more expensive. In the 90s in the auto industry, they were buying parts from China for 70 cents and telling the Indiana supplier, a dollar's too much, China's 30% cheaper. Actually, over a 20-year time period, the Chinese part is 30% more expensive. And they needed 20 years worth of data to figure that out. So if you can go into a company and use Microsoft Office Excel in a way that it helps companies make decisions, because if you have 900,000 lines worth of data, how the heck do you manage that to make a decision? We have classes like CIS 2640 in the Business College where the entire semester you master Excel, and a lot of companies are saying, we need this skill set no matter what your major is and who you work for, can you help us make sense out of data? We also have a business analytics minor, that's two extra classes, where you do things like data mining and data warehousing and database management. I would argue that in the business college, we should make every student minor in that because every employer out there is saying it's really, really important. So keep adding those skill sets, make them strategic, where you help companies make decisions that impact them five, 10 years down the road, and that will jack up your salary and career advancement opportunities. All right, it's uh, 70 degrees and sunny outside. I've just babbled for about an hour. I will stay up here for any questions if you wanna come down. Otherwise, I'm just gonna cut you loose, okay? Thank you.